Good evening. I got to tell y'all, ladies, y'all just totally messed up my entire speech tonight. <laughs> you really did. And I appreciate that. I really do. If you all could bear with me for a second. You know, my mind goes back to elementary school where I first started to learn these words. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God indivisible and the six most important words for me with liberty and justice for all not just for those who may look like me or may not look like me not for those who may think like me or just for those who may not think like me, but for all of us. In August of 2005, I found myself on a hot and humid day in South Florida, standing in front of railroad tracks. I tell folks that that day was so hot and humid that I actually seen, and this is a true story, a dog chasing a cat, and they were both walking. <laughs> True story. But for quite some time, I was able to actually block out that oppressive heat and humidity because at the moment that I was standing in front of those railroad tracks, I was standing there as a broken man with no hope and no self-esteem, and the main thoughts that was running through my mind was not the oppressive heat and humidity, but whether or not I was going to experience pain when I jumped in front of the oncoming train. Contemplating whether when the train hit me, I'm going to die instantly, or would I have to endure moments of agonizing pain as my body was crushed? You see, at that moment, I was homeless. Recently released from prison, addicted to crack cocaine, unemployed, the only thing I owned were the clothes on my back. And I didn't see any light at the end of the tunnel and I was ready to end my life. And so I stood there and I waited and I waited and I waited. So I might be a big guy, but I'm scared of pain. I'm, I'm scared of needles. But even the thought of the pain that I may have to endure was not enough to make me move. And so I stood there. And I waited. And I waited. And I waited. Thinking of how I was a disappointment to my family to my friends being raised in a Christian family. I knew that my parents did not raise me to be in that position that day. But there I was, and I had nowhere else to go. So I waited. I waited. And I waited. But I tell folks today that God had other plans because that train never came. And those railroad tracks were the busiest railroad tracks in Miami-Dade County. It led to the pier, to the port of Miami. And trains come every five, ten minutes, but that day it didn't come. No matter how long I waited, it didn't come. And, and so eventually I crossed those tracks. And I walked a couple blocks further and I was able to check myself into a substance abuse treatment facility. And after completing a four-month program, I, I moved into a homeless shelter again. 
And while there, I decided that I wanted to do something, not to save the world. I just wanted to do something to stop the vicious cycle of drug addiction. You know, some of you might know that you would use drugs and they would take you to a very dark place and you would stop and your life starts to improve and, and then something would happen and you would pick up another drink or a drug and the next thing you know, you're right back where you were, even worse. Over and over and over again and I was tired of that cycle and I knew that if I did it one more time, the next time I'm in front of railroad tracks, maybe I wouldn't be as lucky. And so I decided... The only thing I could think of really was maybe I should go to school because my mother always talked about education. And so I rode in a local community college and I ended up graduating at the top of my class and, and my professors encouraged me to continue my education. So I pursued a bachelor's degree in public safety management with a concentration in criminal justice. You see, I figured I had a lot of experience getting arrested, a lot of experience appearing before judges, a lot of experience being incarcerated, and maybe somehow those experiences would translate into classroom success. And you know what? It did. And I ended up graduating with highest honors, and before you know it, I was accepted in a law school. And in May of 2014, I walked across the stage and received my Juris Doctorate degree from Florida International University College of Law. And so I walk around now with my shoulders thrown back a little bit because I tell folks I have a dual doctorate degree, a doctor of law and a doctor of the streets. You know, I tell folks sometimes that when I was standing in front of those railroad tracks, if somebody would have told me, Desmond, don't jump. Desmond, don't jump because, man, in, in a few years, you're going you're gonna to meet the president of the United States not once but twice. Desmond, please don't jump because you're going to sit on boards with commissioners and mayors and you're going to count as your friends, uh, 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 state attorneys and judges and, and, and all kinds of important officials. Desmond, please, please, Desmond, don't jump. Don't jump, Desmond, because in a few years, you're going to lead an organization to restore voting rights to 1.4 million returning citizens. Desmond, don't jump, please. If you don't jump, in a few years, you're going to be named one of the 100 most influential people, not in the United States, but in the world. You're going to be named a genius. Desmond, please don't jump. If somebody was there when I was in front of those tracks telling me those things, my first reaction would have been to put them in a chokehold and demand that they take me to that spot where they get those good, the, the good dope from. Right? Because it got to be that good dope. Back in my days, they call it tension. It's got to be that fire. Because there was no way that you could have convinced me, a person with a record a mile long, a person who's a, addicted to crack cocaine, a person who was homeless, a person who the only thing he owned were the clothes on his back, a person who was ready to jump in front of a train. There is no way that you could have convinced me that any of that would have happened. But here I am. I'm standing here tonight in front of each and every one of you all as a living example that the word impossible can be repurposed to I am possible. That anything is possible when, number one, when God is on your side and when you're committed to service. When you committed to love, I stand here, right, as an example for those of you who may have to overcome obstacles or will have to overcome obstacles or who are currently facing obstacles. 
that we don't ever have to give up. I'm here as a representative that those people, I remember the people who I used to be, I remember driving by and looking at them thinking that they would never amount to anything. We can't say that anymore. We can't say that about the drug addict. We can't say that about the homeless. We can't say that about the person that's currently incarcerated or the person that's just been released. We cannot say that they don't have anything of substance to offer our community, our state, our country, or even the world. It is such a sweet coincidence that we're in the same theater that they're getting ready to show Black Panther Wakanda forever. And I'm going to tell you why. Two things. I'm going to tell you the first one. When I attended the gala for Time 100, I remember fussing with the Time executives. And I told them, I was like, man, you guys messed up. You guys dropped the ball big time. And they're like, what? What do we do wrong? I was like, you, for that edition of Time 100, they put Dwayne The Rock Johnson on the cover. And I was like, how the heck you put him on the cover? You should have put me on the cover. Right? And it wasn't because I was conceited. But what I explained to them, right, was the fact that if they would have put me on the cover, anybody looking at that edition would know that you don't have to be a movie star. You don't have to be an athlete. You don't have to be a billionaire. You don't even have to be a politician to be one of the 100 most influential people in the world. You don't have to be any of that to have an impact in your community, in your state, in your country. And that was one of the lessons. I already know there's still an embargo. We can't talk about what happened at Wakanda forever. right? But one of the lessons that I took from Wakanda forever, right? And that's why, you know, you sisters really messed me up because the song was, what are you waiting for? Right? One of the lessons from Wakanda forever is that the hero that you're looking for is inside of you. It's inside of you. You don't have to wait and rely on anyone for your liberation. You don't have to wait and rely on anyone to create the world that you want to live in. But here's the other important lesson that I took from Wakanda, though. That that hero cannot fully materialize within you if you're driven by hate. If you're holding resentment animosity, driven by fear. When I was in treatment, I remember I was at my lowest, and I remember watching the funeral of Rosa Parks, the memorial service, when her body laid in state at the rotunda of the Capitol. And it was very significant for me because what I don't tell many people was that after I had crossed those railroad tracks, I had stopped and asked myself, what would have happened if I would have died that day? How many people would have come to my funeral? And the answer was zero. I was homeless, on drugs, on the streets. You didn't have any idea. I would have been buried in a pauper's grave. That was a very lonely feeling. And so I created another set of facts and I said, okay, Desmond, you're, you're killed by the train, and, and, and the Miami Herald have your paper, your, your picture at the front page of the paper, bold headlines, Desmond killed by train. How many people would come? And I thought long and hard, I only came up with four people. And out of those four people, maybe two would have shed a tear. And I questioned my existence. Like, Desmond, all these years of living on this planet and living all these different places and having these different friendships and relationships, only four people will care if you died? Have your life been that insignificant? And I took that question with me and it stayed in my heart until I seen 
the memorial service for Rosa Parks. And when I've seen so many people walking out of there with tears just streaming down their cheeks, something hit me and I jumped up screaming at the television. I was like, that's it, that's it, that's what I want. And my mind started racing and, and I started planning my own funeral, right? And I'm trying to figure out, okay, where am I gonna have this funeral? And I, I landed on the, where the Dolphins played, uh, Joe Robbie Stadium. Um, listen, the idea that I had in my head was eerily similar to what we've seen at the memorial service for Kobe and Gigi Bryant. The only difference was mine was a football stadium and we had chairs on the field. Standing room only, not a dry eye in the house. Because I wanted to feel as if I was significant. That the time that I spent on this planet was worthwhile. And then I ran into a major problem. But Desmond, how are you going to fill a stadium with thousands of people? What are you, you going to do? And I came up with two options. Going to be an athlete or an actor. Now, the athlete part was a little far-fetched because I was a little older. The knees were a little bad. You know, the Dolphins weren't that good that year. Maybe I would have made the team. But you guys shouldn't laugh. Minnesota had some bad years, too, now. <laughs> right? <laughs> Not this year, though. Not this year. But the other option was the actor, and I was immediately, like, really discouraged because when I think of actors, like, ladies, when you think of male actors, who's the first name that come to your mind? Denzel, Denzel Washington. Now, my wife told me I'm, I'm, I'm a good-looking guy. But, and I think I'm halfway decent, but I didn't think I was Denzel Washington type of handsome. Right? And I tell folks, thank God that I didn't think about Forrest Whitaker. Because I know I got him beat. And I probably got Wesley Snipes beat, too, as long as I don't you know, show my abs. Because I, I got a six-pack. I mean, a... Really, I got a keg. He got a six-pack. But I only thought of Denzel Washington. And I was like, man, I am not Denzel Washington type of handsome. So I can't be an actor. And I got depressed. But my mind quickly went back to Rosa Parks. That she what? So not today. She did one act to where we, even to this day, we feel the impact of. And so I quickly thought that maybe, Desmond, if you could take the pain and the suffering and low self-esteem that led you to these railroad tracks, if you could take that and package it in such a way that way you can help others, right? And then they can help others and so on, like that Perk commercial. You know, they tell two friends, and those friends tell two friends, and so on and so on. That pretty soon when you die, you have a stadium full of people that are like, man, Desmond made an impact in my life. And so that's what I decided to do. Even though I didn't know what, I, I'd never been an activist or anything like that. I didn't know where to start. But fortunately, while I was still in treatment, during a, a, a group therapy session, I said something. And after the therapy session, a young man approached me and told me that what, whatever it was that I said caused him to experience a paradigm shift and basically caused him to have a brighter outlook in life, or to have hope. And while he was telling me that, something erupted inside of me that I had never in my life felt before. And I could tell you this evening that I was experiencing a joy that I didn't even know existed, yet it was a joy that I was chasing all of my life and didn't even know I was chasing it. See, at that moment, I was coming into awareness of what my purpose was on, on this planet. Why am I here? Why are you here? And it was a very simple answer, to give back. You see, because I looked around at nature, everything that God had created, and I seen that they took a little and they gave a little. And I understood that no matter what my station was in life, no matter how much or how little money I had, no matter what title or, or I had or didn't have, that there was always someone that was worse off than me 
that could benefit from my experience, strength, and hope. That in spite of what I've gone through, in spite of where I may be at today, that there is something that I can do to make this world a better place. And so at night, when I was thinking about what I'm going to wear for the next day, I used to throw my shoes under the belt, under the bed. Thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> throw my shoes under the bed. So when I get up the next morning and get dressed to go out, I have to get my shoes, which is under the bed, which means I have to get down on my knees to reach under the bed to get my shoes. And since I'm down there on my knees, I might as well have a conversation with my higher power. And the conversation was very simple. First and foremost, I prayed for people who I thought was my enemies that they would experience the love and comfort that I was experiencing with my relationship with my higher power. Then I prayed for the protection of my family. And then the last thing I prayed for, which took me the longest, was to pray for strength, stamina, wisdom, discernment, and courage to do God's work. And his work was very simple. That every time I step out of my house, to do something to create a better world for everyone. Tonight, I can look any one of you in your eyes right now and tell you that when I was on my knees praying, I was praying for you. I was praying for you because I love you. And you may say, Desmond, how could you say that when you never even met me? I didn't have to meet you because guess what? It didn't matter what you looked like. It didn't matter what your politics was. It didn't matter what your ethnicity was. It didn't matter what your sexual identity was. It didn't matter what your immigration status was. What mattered most was that you was a human being and I connected with your humanity. That is what mattered. And I understood that they cannot be a me without you. understood that. I also understood that sometimes how we bastardize that word, that word love, right, and how we just throw it around so easily without truly understanding the depth of that word. I remember I used to tell folks that the easiest way for me to define love is wanting for your neighbor what you want for yourself. You see, because if I want liberty and justice for me, then I need to fight for liberty and justice for you. Regardless of what you look like, regardless of what you may think, regardless of whether or not we agree, regardless of whether or not you like it, love me. You see, it's so easy to say, I love you to someone that confers a benefit to you. It's easy to say, I love you to someone that makes you feel good. Oh, that's easy. That's not the impressive piece. You want to be impressive? Learn how to love someone that hates you. Learn how to love someone that don't agree with you. Because that is the true test of love. That is where the rubber hits the road. You see, and I am not being aspirational. I'm not being the modern version of Don Quixote. I am not. You may think I am, but I'm telling you that my desire. You see, because this democracy piece and this, this, this criminal justice piece, right, fits neatly into this much broader piece of liberty and justice for all and loving each other and caring about the humanity in each other. I know it. And it is already inherent in each and every one of us. But we have allowed labels and, and different types of division to separate us and make us lose sight of each other's humanity. And it's now tribalism that have taken, the, have taken over our conversations and our, and our emotions. 
when deep down inside fighting to get out is our natural desire to love each other in spite of. Desmond, you are crazy. I submit to you that I'm not. Point number one, natural disasters. When a natural disaster hit, how we as a community, have, as we as a country, respond to our neighbors in peril clearly demonstrates that. I know for a fact, Andy, since he's my kindred brother, Andy's driving down the road somewhere in town. And Andy sees someone who's involved in an accident that's laying on the side of the road. Car accident. Guy's laid on the side of the road. Andy decides to stop his car and get out. He gets out of his car. He runs up to that person. I guarantee you that Andy's first question to that person is not going to be, did you vote for Donald Trump? It's not going to be, what's your sexual identity? How much money you make? What's your immigration status? Were you ever incarcerated? Are you a violent or nonviolent offender? That's not going to be his question. His question is going to be, are you okay or how can I help? It's in moments of calamity and peril that we go to our natural instinct to connect with each other's humanity. And we don't care about those things that divide us on a daily basis. And I believe that we don't have to wait until a natural disaster hit. We don't have to wait until a hurricane. We don't have to wait until a snowstorm. We don't have to wait until an earthquake. We don't have to wait until a condo collapse to show each other the type of, uh, of dignity and respect that we will want shown to us. And I'm telling you that it is so deep within us that we are even willing to risk our own lives to come to the rescue of someone who we don't even know. We don't know what their political views are. We don't know what their religious views are. But we were willing to put our own life in harm's way for them. It's in us. It's in us. And I think we've shown, even with Amendment 4, where we was able to get such a broad cross-section of people together. We were able to elevate our issue above partisan politics and even implicit racial biases and bring people together along the lines of humanity and have over 5.1 million people say yes to Amendment 4. Over 5.1 million people, a million more people than who voted for the governor of our state. Over a million people were conservatives, registered Republicans. And I tell people that one of the proudest moments of that night when we won that uh, initiative was the fact that when I looked at those 5.1 million votes, I didn't see 5.1 million votes that was based on hate or fear, but rather 5.1 million votes that was based on love, forgiveness and redemption. And we showed this state of Florida, we showed the world that love, love can in fact win the day. And so I believe, I believe that if we could learn to look through the lens of love rather than a red lens or a blue lens or a green lens or a black lens or a white lens, or a straight lens, but look through the lens of love, we're able to move major issues. We're able to create a world where we don't have to live in fear of our neighbor. We're able to create a society where there truly is liberty and justice for all. Thank you.